vaccinated, but still, you are never sure. So, let's take a look. Um, today, we will have some stuff we are going to speak about. First of all, I would like to finish physiology with you. It might be, I have no idea. Some dyspnea. No, I have taste, I have a breath, but uh, a little bit of dyspnea. It could be psychogenic because of many cases around me, or it could be COVID himself. So I can't tell for sure, except if I do the PCR. So I'm waiting until the evening. If I will have uh, symptoms continuously, I will test myself. Um, and uh, if until the evening I keep feeling like this, it goes away then it goes away it was psychogenic i forgot i opened the pool for you today guys and we said we are going to do a little bit of embryology and that's what i want to start with today for the first hour so the situation is going to um uh, it's going to be as follows when we are speaking about the embryology uh, you need to start from the beginning like since the moment we had the spermatozoa so First of all, uh, we have a spermatozoa that goes and meet uh, the oocyte. Can somebody tell me where does this process take place? Absolutely, inside of the fallopian tube for this. Uh, so yeah, it occurs in the fallopian tube. This is important. So the oocyte is, relate, is released from the ovaries. After that, it starts swimming in the fallopian tube and it meets a sperm. After the sperm and the oocyte attach to each other, the name changes. We call it a what? We call it a zygote, okay? So it changes the name and it becomes zygote. So this is a cycle. So anytime we have fertilization of the oocyte with the sperm, we will have a zygote. Guys, when the sperm enter inside of the oocyte, um, will it have the tail with it and the neck or only the head? Yep, just the tip. Abs no, only the head, only the head, only the acrosome, that's it. The neck contains the mitochondria. So the mitochondria will not make it inside. It, det it detach. I will show you. So th this is stuff you might think I'm. Oh, I'm wasting your time on them, but actually, they are super important. Take a look. So, the head is just like go. It goes, bunches the oocyte, and after it bunches the oocyte, it's going to release this thing. This thing we call it the acrosome, which is the nucleic acid material of the sperm. How many chromosomes does it have? Does anybody have an idea? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. So, twenty-three chromosomes, and it will be pushed inside. So, take a look. The mitochondria normally is located within the neck. So, that means, as you can see, only the acrosome makes it in, the sperm nucleus. The rest is going to be kicked out outside. So the mitochondria that we get, do we get it from our father or from our mother? The mother. So that's important. In the future, we are go I'm going to tell you about mitochondrial uh, diseases that inherited mitochondrially. And we can only get them from mom. That's it. Exactly. That's why the mitochondrial diseases only come from mom. Our mother gave us a lot, including her mitochondria and the mitochondrial diseases as well. So, after the sperm makes the zygote, the zygote starts dividing into two part, four part, eight part, 16 part. And it keeps dividing, dividing, dividing until it makes a structure called the morula. So what does morula mean? Anybody have an idea? Morula. Morula means strawberry, okay? So the morula, it means a strawberry-like shape. For me, it does not look like a strawberry, but I don't know. So it means strawberry. 
if you can see it like a strawberry it's a strawberry if you don't you are like me so after this strawberry has formed then we will have formation of something else so notice zygote four cells eight cells morula and then a blastocyst blastocyst <clears throat> The blastocysts have two sections, one thin section and one thick section. The thick section is going to make the baby, the thin section is going to make the sac. But for that to happen, it has to do the process of adhering into the, um, the uterus. So um, that process we call implementation. So we spoke about the process of fertilization and then we spoke now we are speaking about the process of implantation i forgot to mention one process which is ovulation in which the oocyte leave the ovary so we have ovulation we have fertilization and see the sperm entering inside of it then we have the implementation okay so now the blastocyst has attached into the uterus wall the moment the attachment happens which hormone will be released Anybody have an idea of which hormone going to be released? It's really, it's really important for diagnosing pregnancy. Absolutely correct. It's the beta HCG. Guys, does the attachment happen right away or takes around a week to occur? The answer that it takes a week or plus or minus, plus or minus, but uh, like we can say a week. So if a lady have unprotected sex and then check herself for a pregnancy and she tests negative, does it mean she is a truly negative or this test is completely useless absolutely it's completely useless why i'm telling you this guys i'm telling you this because of a common new assembly question that you might face and sadly a common life situation that sadly you might face which is either a rape patient they will give you in the usmle like a, a female patient who was raped or also um a lady who had an unprotected sex and she's seeking your help uh, with it first of all let's start with some ethical stuff if a rape patient tells you not to report to the police what you will do she's adult but she tell you not to report sadly you don't report guys if she tells you not to report you don't have to report you don't report so the next thing um um, what you have to do for a rape patient, you have to check for STIs. You have to, yes, minor your report. You don't think it was. If, his, if a minor or a really old patient um, have some sexual abuse, you report. Don't worry about the consequences. The law will protect you, even if you were wrong. So if we speak about the rape patient, yes, you have to give the prophylaxis. I mean, you need to check for STI, give a prophylaxis against the pregnancy and give a prophylaxis against uh, the, the STIs as well. Um, also, you need to document it, guys. If, yes, yes. Um, so basically, uh, you, you have to document it. Of course, you will take the uh, permission. But if you have the permission, you have to document it. I mean, with ca it's, it's, it's a difficult procedure that she will have to, you will have to take photos for her for like if she got any type of scratches and stuff like that. It's basically a total forensic investigation. I know she's a living human being, but the forensics also play a role in that. You have to take a semen sample if it's available. And yeah, if she has scratches, scratches tells you that it might have been something violent. You need to check if she's lying or not also. So th there is a lot of things you have to check for. Okay. Anyway, away from the baby, uh, rape patient, I'm here for embryology. So the blastocysts bind to the endometrium. After binding to the endometrium, what happens? Well, this is the process of implementation. Implementation occur and we have the beginning of a formation of a new era. The new era is something like this. You can see the invade the invasion. So can you see he, here? Here you can see the invasion of the syncytiotrophoblast. Do we need to know acrosome reaction? I'm not sure what that means, so of course you don't. <laughs> um, so syncytiotroph. Uh, so we have here. Uh, <laughs> it penetrates in the follicle. Not really. No. 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 Mm -mm. You don't need to know such a stuff. 
So the syncytial trophoblast will help you to penetrate the uterus, and after it penetrates the uterus, it's going to adhere into the walls. The adhesion into the walls now will create some cavities. Ah, the zona pellucida. The, actually, zona pellucida you do have to know, but this is I'm going to re-explain in reproductive. Today, I'm just trying to give you some knowledge about embryology. So you, because um, basically what happened that some people contacted me from the group and told me they feel lost and I get it because if you don't, if you, did, if you never heard about this process, you will, that's okay to feel lost. You know, you need to know how it happens and we will be building up on it. So we have the formation of something called the bilaminar embryonic disc. This is important. Now we are talking. So let's take a look. So you can see here, this one, you can see the bilaminar embryonic disc. Hmm, why am I obsessing about it? Well, there is here an area that is called the amniotic cavity that probably will give the amniotic sac. And we have another area here that probably will give the yolk sac, yes? So, so that's, so far we have the bilaminar. Bilaminar has two layers, yeah? So the bilaminar disc, which is in between, one area was facing the um, yolk sac, the other area was facing the amniotic sac. The bilaminar will become a trilaminar. The trilaminar it contains an ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Okay, so you need to know now what each structure gives, okay? So if we are speaking about the endoderm, that's why I'm explaining this whole thing. What does the endoderm give? <clears throat> what does the endoderm give? <coughs> the foregut, hand gut. Yes. It basically gives you the GIT. Yes. And the mid gut. It gives you the GIT. Okay, so that is the first one. That is the endoderm. So it gives you the primitive gut and it gives you all of this structure, including the lung. If we are speaking about the ectoderm, the ectoderm, mainly what you need to know that it gives us our brain structure, both the BNS and the CNS. Um, and also it gives us our skin. Wait a second. Am I telling you that the skin and the brain come from the same embryological origin? The answer is yes. Does that have any clinical relevance? Well, if I'm telling you about it, it means that absolutely yes. Which clinical relevance does that have? Uh, have? I mean, the fact that the skin and the CNS both come from ectoderm. Absolutely correct. A neurocutaneous disorder. Neurocutaneous disorder, if you take a look at, the, at them, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, st uh, Sturge-Weber syndrome, all of these, they have some skin symptoms and they have some nervous system symptoms. Having both of these systems tell you basically that both of them come from the similar origin, which is like the So the mesoderm, on the other hand, give you, well, most of the other stuff, blood vessels, blood itself, the heart, the muscles, the uh, skin. Skeleton, uh, the skeleton itself okay all of this stuff comes from it let me send you this image actually it's a good one you don't have to know all of the small classification but you have to know the biggest stuff okay so let's take a look okay again so this is the trilaminar embryonic disc you can see the ectoderm here you can see the endoderm here and you can see the mesoderm in between when we speak about the ectoderm it's facing what? It's facing the amniotic sac. When you speak about the endoderm, it's facing what? It's facing the yolk sac, yeah? Okay. So, let us let me just make sure you got that. So, there is a structure called the notochord, guys. The notochord, it comes from mesoderm, but it leads to induction of the ectoderm. And by, by the function of what does the notochord produce to induce the ectoderm to make the, uh, basically, 
the tube neuronal tube the sonic hedgehog yes absolutely sonic hedgehog remember sonic the hedgehog this guy <clears throat> yep sonic hedgehog okay and that helped us to form the neuronal tube hmm where did we study neuronal tube anybody has an idea we did not do cns yet so where did we study it we study it in cardiology absolutely why did we study it in cardiology because I told you that, uh, yes, absolutely, because from the ectoderm also, in addition to the neuronal tube, we had the neuronal crust cells. And the neuronal crust cells gave us the cushing of the heart. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> nice. So I hope now you understand where does... Oh, okay. So let me check just one thing. You don't have to know the names of the little structure. This is not for the USMLE. This is for your school exams that you will not never get asked about again. But for the sake of USMLE, you must understand the three layers, what comes out of them. So you can see here, there is an attachment. What is this organ? What are we attaching with? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, but I know it's the vessels, but we said that, the, well, basically the blastocyst attached to something. That something was the uterus, yeah? I'm just trying to create an imagination for you for this thing, guys. So this is the uterus, uterine wall, basically. And here you can see the attachment. And here we have two sacs. How do we call the yellow sac here, the lower one, the yellow one? How do we call it? Yes, this is the yolk sac. And which, which layer is facing it? Which embryogenic layer is facing it? Endoderm, absolutely. And endoderm give which structure? Yes, correct. What about the blue one? <clears throat> the blue one Amni amniotic sac and uh, here you can see amniotic sac and you can see here what you can see the ectoderm absolutely correct nice um now we can move on and we can speak about other stuff so this was a general overview of the embryology but now i have to add some more things so when I speak with you guys about the mesoderm, I think some of you saw something called uh, like pharyngeal pouches and arches and probably got a panic attack because of that. So let me tell you a little bit about them. Just really quick uh, overview about them for you to understand what are these, what we are speaking about and all of that. So basically when the baby is developing, after all of this that just happened already the development of the baby continues and that's what i'm going to explain in a second yes so here we have all of the blastocysts the implementation it's inside of the wall perfecto let's keep it going so now we have the ectoderm mesoderm endoderm they did their job we got that and the next thing we have, we have this implementation, all of that. And uh, yeah, there is something missing here. Yes, that was what I'm looking for. There is something called the pharyngeal apparatus. You are like, yeah, yeah, like the pharynx where we swallow. Absolutely not. So the pharyngeal apparatus, it's a portion of the body of the baby. Okay. So if you look at the baby, yes, this is a baby. Yes. Maybe you have seen this picture before. This is the baby, I mean the embryo to be more exact. See this? This is the embryo. So if you take the embryo, and you cut him, you are going to see a few structure. So let's do that. 
Some of this structure you are going to appreciate here are neuronal tube. We know what that gives. What does the neuronal tube give? What does the neuronal tube give? Um, the neuronal tube give us the CNS and the BNS, yeah? And it also, near it, we will have the neuronal crust. And then we have this pharyngeal apparatus. You can see um, that we have the following. If you notice here, this thing, yeah? These are the arches, guys. These are the arches. Okay, so we call these pharyngeal arches, okay? So, okay, so we have pharyngeal arch. So that area is the pharyngeal ar arch and it will give um, some structure. Each pharyngeal pouch, pouch is the whole thing basically, okay? So you saw what is the arch. Now let me so show you exactly what is the pouch. I am looking for a colored, yes, okay, good. Okay, so, okay, I think this is good enough. Um, yeah, so this is the embryo. Yes, this is the eye, this is the ear, and this is the pharyngeal apparatus. If you cut the pharyngeal apparatus, you will see something like this, okay? And this structure inside of it is still, this is not a good enough picture, but this is, let me see. Mm, yes, that's much better. So it contains the pouches here, which is to the inside and the arches here, as you can see. And each one of these has a different artery. I mean, the artery is completely different and it has a relationship to a totally different thing that we'll speak about later. I love this picture. Okay, so we have the arches and we have the pouches. Excellent. Okay, so and we have the cleft. Now all of them are at once, which is good, finally. So we have the cleft, pouch, and arch, okay? So um, we used to call them cab, you know, like a cab, um, taxi. So how, what, what do I mean by cab? It's C, A for the arch, and B for the pouch. So that is the cab, okay? So we call them the cab, and from each of these structure, something different will happen. In cardiology, you learn some of it. In reproductive, you will repeat everything you learned in cardiology. And in each system, we are going to speak about a little bit more about this thing, okay? I don't want to go into details because this is not the reproductive chapter. This is just an overview. Basically, if you take a look here. Oh, it was here all the time. So you can see the baby here, and this is the pharyngeal apparatus. If you cut it, you are able to see the cleft, the arch, and the pouch, which is the cap, okay? So each one of these structure, we have six of them. Each one of them is going to give a totally different embryological structure. One of them that they really love, they, they can ask you, where does the BDA come from? I mean, beta ductus arteriosus. Well, it comes from the left sixth pharyngeal arch. And now it makes sense why the arch, because it contains the artery, yes? So the artery is contained within the arch, yes? And each of these, there is basically a huge list that you will have to memorize, but not now, in the future, and each one of them gives different structure. And there is a few connections as well that you will have to know in reproductive, but I will not waste your time on that right now. I just gave you an overview about the reproductive se uh, section, but the reproductive section himself will do it when we do reproductive because otherwise I, I will be explaining this twice. And for the sake of time, I just give you the overview and we can build up on that. So that well, this is the set minimum of things you have to know. So we can build up on it and get a new knowledge. You must know where it does what does it mean, the laminar disc, where it comes from, and what, is, what does it give? Remember, just um, repeating everything really quick. We had a, a, um, evolution of the oocyte from the ovaries. It came out, after it came out, it uh, went into the fallopian tube. It has moved, attached with the sperm. With the sperm, it kept going. 
it made uh, the zygote zygote two cyst for uh, sorry two cells four cells eight cells 16 cells morula a blastocyst the blastocyst attached to the um, uterine wall with a process of implementation yes and after that we had formation of the bilaminar disc which then got converted into the three laminar disc the three laminar disc one area was facing the amniotic sac and the other area was facing the yolk sac in the middle we had endoderm mesoderm and ectoderm and the ectoderm gave the cns and the skin the meso uh, the endoderm gave the git and the respiratory tract and the rest of these gay came from the mesoderm now i have a question does anybody remember the only organ in in the body that is mesodermal but get an endodermal type of a blood supply the sibling absolutely correct this is a question that is really commonly asked so you must know let me repeat it what is the only organ that is a mesodermal organ which is the sibling but gets the blood supply from an endodermal origin what is the blood supply for the sibling guys I mean, the celiac trunk, which gives the sublinic artery, absolutely correct. Yes, that is the one. Okay, guys, so that is it for the embryology. This is just a quick overview of it. Now we'll take just 10 minutes of a break for a, to fresh up, and then we'll come back and start our GIT section. So see you guys in 10 minutes. The last thing we spoke about yesterday was the vitamin and mineral absorption. And I was telling you guys that the iron is absorbed from the duodenum and the folate from the small intestine and the B12 from the terminal ileum. So the terminal ileum disease was mostly um, the terminal ileum disease was mostly what? vitamin b12 especially secondary to crohn's disease okay so bayer's patches bayer's patches are only located between uh sorry are only located in the which portion of the intestine in the ileum yep so they're right they are unencapsulated lymphoid tissue which is atypical for the lymphoid tissues remember lymphoid tissue when we had it in the lymph node it was encapsulated when it was in the thymus it was encapsulated when it was in the sibling it was encapsulated but in the bayer's batches it's unencapsulated so it's found in the lamina propria of the ileum and the submucosa of the ileum as well it has m cells that sample and present antigen to immune cells which infectious disease use m cells to enter the body absolutely correct shigella yes and the b cells stimulated in the germinal centers of the beer's batches differentiate into iga secreting plasma cells which ultimately reside in the lamina propria. So let's speak a little bit about IgA. IgA, it, it, it is covering all of the surfaces of the um, GIT, uh, the mucosa, excellent, and in, in the respiratory system, it's also located. And can somebody tell me, please, in case of IgA deficiency, what will happen to the patient if you give him blood? IgA deficiency, what will happen to the patient if you give him blood? Anaphylaxis. Um, in, in a patient with IgA deficiency, IgA immunodeficiency, if you give him blood, um, like during a transfusion, what will happen to him? The answer is 
anaphylactic shock. Yeah, so he will get anaphylactic shock. He get the anaphylactic shock because he will have anti IgA inside of his blood. So when he's exposed to the IgA the first time, he's going to have a what? An anaphylactic shock. So IgA receives a protective security component and is then transported across the epithelium to the gut to deal with intraluminal antigen. Can IgA be secreted alone? Oh no, it cannot. Sorry, it's written here, the secretory component. So let me show you this. So this is the IgA secretory component, as you can see. It's this snake-like structure around the IgA. Remember, IgA is a dimer. And what do we call the connection between, what do we call this chain, which connecting the two IgAs? The J chain, absolutely. And the next thing is the, is the bile. And the bile is composed of bile salts. Um, bile acid conjugated to, what is bile salts? It's bile acid conjugated to glycine and taurine, um, making them water soluble. So the bile salts are water soluble. Uh, it also contains phospholipid, cholesterol, and bilirubin, and water, and ions. What I want you to know about all of these is the following. I want you to know that biles contain mainly cholesterol and bilirubin. Okay? So, if we will have increase in the um, cholesterol, we will have a cholesterol stone. But if we have an increase of the bilirubin, we will have a pigmented stone or a bilirubin stone. So cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase catalyzes a, a rate-limiting step in the bile acid synthesis. Does anybody remember some drug that lead to stimulation of the 7-alpha hydroxylase, which can precipitate to leading to stones, creation of the stones? This drug was an antilipidemic drug we studied in cardiology. So I'm asking about the drug that we studied in cardiology that can lead to inhibition of the, uh, sorry, overstimulation of the 7-alpha hydroxylase, which basically will lead to uh, formation of cholesterol stone. It is fibrate. It is fibrate. Okay, so the function of the bile. The function of the bile is digestion and absorption of the lipids and the fat-soluble vitamin. What are the fat soluble vitamins, guys? A, A, D, E, and K. A, D, E, and K. So, which is the addict? If somebody forget about them, it's A, D, E, and K. Addict. Okay. So the function is to also do bilirubin and cholesterol excretion. It's uh, one way that our body can lead to release of the bilirubin, especially the conjugated type. Also the antimicrobial effect. I mean, after all, where is the bile is released? The bile is released into the oidenome. So, if we release bile inside of the duodenum and there is some bacteria who survive the acid of the stomach, now it's going to be destroyed. So, the bile decreases absorption of enteric, uh, enteric bile salts at the distal ileum, as in cases of short bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease. Basically, some patients who have a Crohn's disease or short bowel syndrome, their distal ileum will be messed up. So, the absorption of the bile salts from the intestine will fail. Yes? If it fails, what will happen to this patient? It's failing. So, um, this enterohepatic circulation, we call it, it's failing. So, you will be unable to absorb the bile salts. The bile salts are going to the colon. Does anybody remember what can the bile salts bind to here? It's related to kidney stones, guys. B 
Remember, bile salts have a lot of cholesterol in them. So they can bind to the calcium, which can lead to the subunification process, and it's going to go out inside of the feces. And the oxalate will be left behind, which during its absorption, it can lead to oxalate stone. So these patients have the following. They are going to have decreased absorption of the enteric bile salts at the distal ileum, like for example, in short bowel syndrome and the Crohn's disease. It prevent normal fat absorption and may cause bile acid diarrhea. So calcium, which normally bind to oxalate, bind to the fat instead. So free oxalate is observed by the gut. That increases the frequency of the oxalate kidney stones. Does anybody remember how does a calcium oxalate crystal looks like under microscopy? Envelope shape or dumbbells. Dumbbells. So let's speak a little bit about the bilirubin. The bilirubin, uh, where it comes from, how is it metabolized, all of this, this process. Heme is metabolized by heme oxygenase. Uh, first of all, where does the heme come from? Well, from the RBCs. RBC basically is a big bag which contains a lot of hemoglobin, heme and globin. Globin is a protein that can be broken down into amino acid. But the heme is basically the following. Let's take a look at heme molecule. Heme molecule, heme molecule is consisting of two things, iron in the middle and the structure around it that is called protoborphyrin. Okay, so iron and the protoborphyrin. I hope you can see it, iron and the protoborphyrin. So the iron is iron, end of the story, but the protoborphyrin can be changing in the structure, which can be leading to formation of biliverdin. Yeah, Billy Verdin. The Billy Verdin can then be converted into bilirubin. Yeah, so it's basically one structure becoming another structure. Notice the Billy Verdin look like the protoborphyrin, but obviously without the iron. And then when you uh, basically stretch it out, it just becomes bilirubin. So if we speak about this thing, um, this thing, so the heme, it is going to form the indirect bilirubin. And does anybody know, is indirect bilirubin water soluble or fat soluble? It's fat soluble. This is serious if it's fat soluble. Why? Why we are more scared from it if it was fat soluble? Absolutely, because it can affect the brain. Water soluble will not affect the brain, but the fat soluble will affect the brain. Okay, so let it affect the brain. What can the patient have if it goes inside of the brain? Kernicterus, encephalopathy, absolutely. Okay, good. So the next thing is <clears throat> unconjugated bilirubin is going to bind into the albumin, okay? And that unconjugated form is going to hold itself and continues into the liver, okay? Inside of the liver, the unconjugated bilirubin is going to be converted into other stuff. So we have the following. Unconjugated bilirubin will be worked at by an enzyme called udb glucuronyl transferase, which, which its main function is conjugation. So it's going to conjugate the indirect bilirubin into bilirubin. Guys, is this uh, enzyme a part of a bigger system? And if it was a part of a bigger system, please say its name. It's, yeah, well, it's in the liver and it's a part of the cytochrome B Yep, yep, it's the cytochrome B450, yeah? We will study in pharmacology that there is something called the cytochrome B450 in which it can uh, lead to two phases. It has phase one and phase two. 
and uh, when we study it i will be teaching you guys that the phase one has a reduction oxygenation and hydroxylation and the phase two has the conjugation process so the conjugation it's not only for bile it can be used for alcohol even okay so it it's for so many other things as well so the next thing we have is uh the direct bilirubin it then, then makes it to the gut and after it makes it to the gut the gut some gut bacteria can convert it to uh, orobilinogen which can be either renally secreted so it gets absorbed and uh, uh, cleared by the kidney which gives the urobilin to the urine giving it its yellow color and it can give it also the stercobilin to the feces that's why feces are brown it's weird basically next time you go to the toilet you can know why your stool is brown it's because of the blood yeah heme in direct bilirubin direct bilirubin erobilinogen uh, stercobilin brown stools okay what about the the direct or the conjugated bilirubin is it water soluble or fat soluble water soluble okay since it is water soluble will it be cleared uh, where it will be cleared mostly the kidney there is one patient that once told me he had like cholelithiasis basically uh, which is uh, causing mechanical jaundice and you know in mechanical jaundice is it direct or indirect bilirubin hi so exactly it's the direct one so i was asking this patient did your your he had jaundice clearly like i mean his sclera was yellow and i was asking him well did, did anything happen to your the color of your urine and he was like yeah it looks like blood i was like really he was like yeah it looks like cappuccino i was like okay man well seriously he was like yeah yeah it looks like beer but really thick beer it's like wow interesting so basically his urine um when he gave us a sample seriously it looked like bloody but it's not the bloody it was just the orobilin yes this is a dipstick test the dipstick test can tell you um, if it does contain uh, bilirubin uh, or not. If it does not, this will be negative. Um, so simply in this test, you can see that the color is darker, which indicates it's one of the lower ones, which means it's a positive test. Okay, let's just speak a little bit about pathology. I will not go to deep, guys. Seriously, my breathing is not that good, so I... We'll do sialolithiasis, salivary gland tumor, achalasia, and hopefully do some of the esophageal pathologies and then call it off for the day. So speaking about sialolithiasis, so the word sialo means salivary gland. Lithiasis means stones, okay guys? So it's a stone inside of the salivary gland duct. So this salivary gland duct, does anybody rem remember where does the salivary gland opens? You can cheat if you want, you can feel it with your tongue. The one for the borotidic gland, of course. So it basically opens exactly, exactly near the second upper molar. So this is the second upper molar. You can feel it with your tongue, like mm -hmm -hmm, mm -hmm -hmm. so you can just feel it with your tongue, and um, it can be basically obstructed. And if it's obstructed, this is serious because anytime we have obstruction, what happens behind it? inflammation yep so a stone in the salivary gland duct can occur at the three major glands the parotid gland the mandibular gland and the sublingual gland single stone more common in the submandibular gland which opens to something called the warthin duct which is under the tongue it's associated with salivary stasis um, so basically what can lead to the stone 
it's the stasis. And when do we have a stasis? When we have dehydration. If we have dehydration, we will have less saliva. Also with the trauma of the duct itself. Okay, so it presents as a recurrent pre or a very brandal vein uh, and the swelling in the affected gland. Well, what is the story? What does it mean very brandal, guys? Very brandal, brandal, what does it mean? Yeah, so when, when you see food, what happens to you? When you see really delicious food, Yep, when you see really delicious food, you get yourself salivation. Yep, so the salivation, when it occurs, you will get what? You will get more passage. Uh, just a second. Yes, more passage of the saliva towards the gland. And since the duct is obstructed, the vein is going to become exceeded. The vein is going to become more. So sialadenitis, inflammation of the salivary gland due to an obstruction and infection. So the staph aureus and mumps virus. Guys, um, do we have an, a, a vaccination against the mumps virus? Yeah, absolutely. The MMR vaccine. Yes. So it's they write for us that also it can be due to immune mediated mechanism like Sjogren syndrome. Does anybody remember what else Sjogren syndrome patient had? Dry everything. I like that answer. So, dry vagina, dry mouth, dry eyes, dry everything. Yep. So, okay, somebody has cialo, uh, cialolithiasis. I want to teach you guys how to treat it because you will get this in real life. Even if not in the exam, you can get it in real life with family members. So, the patient had a stone. You have to get it out. Should we use which size of scalpel should you use is it a 20 15 or 10 i mean the stone is stuck in the duct it's right here no 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 scalpel guys don't be that person no only a surgeon will be like oh you have a stone nah you totally need a scalpel no need for a scalpel just massage that's it massage the gland bring a warm cloth okay put it in a hot water it's warm take it put it on the uh, where is the duct is if not from the inside from the outside keep massaging it put your finger here massage it as well and push it out, 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 it will just bob out. It's actually quite a satisfaction when you do it to somebody because he's screaming out of pain and you just bring this warm cloth, make him put it for like five, 10 minutes and then no need for surgery, absolutely not. And then you put your, your finger inside and literally you, bulb, you massage it until it gets out, okay? Also, you can give the patient something called sour candy. I don't know if you know what that is. So this sour candy. Why do we give it? Because this is basically a salivary stone. It's like a kidney stone. How do we treat a kidney stone? By increasing urination. How do you treat a, uh, basically a salivary stone? By increasing salivation. And the best thing to do it is sour candy. Guys, don't be, well, I love surgeons, but they are a little bit sometimes too invasive. How do we call two surgeons looking at an ECG? There is this joke, it's actually interesting. How do we call two surgeons looking at an ECG? We call it a double blind test. <laughs> okay, so the next one. 
So salivary gland tumors. So the salivary gland tumors go something like this. It's most are benign and commonly affect the parotid gland. So they most likely to affect the parotid gland. And uh, nearly half of all submandibular gland neoplasms and most sublingual and minor glands uh, tumor are malignant. To make it simple for you guys, the smaller the gland, the highest risk of the malignancy. Parotid gland tumors are mostly benign, but the smaller gland tumor are highly malignant. So, common question. Well, how can I differentiate between a salivary gland tumor and sialolithiasis? Sialolithiasis can make the gland swelling and bigger, yes? But the question is, sialolithiasis, will it be painful or painless? I mean the gland. Painful. While salivary gland tumor, it will be also enlarged, but it will be painful or painless. Painless, absolutely. So the salivary gland tumor, pain is good. <laughs> oh yeah. So a bleo, uh, uh, sorry, before a bleo, typically presents as a painless mass and the swelling, facial paralysis or pain suggest malignant involvement. Yep. So if pain occurs, that means it was too invasive that it has initially to start painless. That's the important thing. But after some times, it can invade nerves like the trigeminal nerve. And after the invasion, it can lead to the pain. But before that, it's atypical to cause the pain. Why do we have facial paralysis? If you look, take a look at the facial nerve, the facial nerve goes directly through the parotid gland. See, this is the parotid gland and the facial nerve going directly through it. So if the patient has a cancer of the parotid gland, he's at high risk of developing destruction of the facial nerve. Okay, so um, they say, we have a bleomorphic adenoma, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and Warthan tumor. Let's start with the first one, bleomorphic adenoma. It's a benign mixed tumor, most common salivary gland tumor. It's a Composed of chondro. What does the word chondro mean? Chondro means cartilage. Mixoid, it's like a mixoma structure. And when you take a look at it here, this region is the chondrocyte. Let me show you how a chondrocyte look like and how can you... Chondrocyte are cartilage basically. And when you look at it, there's different types of cartilage. Yes, something like this. It can have this structure, okay? It does have the cells, the chondrocyte themselves, but it mostly have this structure. So it's a chondromyxoid stroma and epithelium and reoccur if incompletely resected or rupture intraoperatively and may underwent malignant transformation. What do I mean by that? For the cell, if they ask you, if they give you a patient who had a previously the tumor and uh, he had the surgery, you removed it and it came back, and they ask you why it came back, the answer is because of the surgeon did not remove the whole thing, okay? So, um, if we take a look at, uh, if we take a look at this, um, Basically, if the structure, if the gland was like this, the surgeon is going to come and he's going to, yes, remove this portion, remove, 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 remove. But he forgets something like this. Can it regrow from this? The answer is, yes, absolutely. It can grow up to the full size or even bigger. It can become like before. So everything you done was for nothing, yeah? So it's really important for the surgeon to be really careful and make sure that he removed the whole thing. If he did not, he will make the patient suffer one more surgery, okay? 
and this tumor is benign but it can become malignant the mucoepidermoid one is the most common malignant tumor overall and it has both a mucinous and sequamous component any tumor that has a sequamous component what you will see inside of it i mean sequamous cell carcinoma of the cervix lung head and neck um, glands doesn't matter all of them have the exact same thing something called keratine barrels this is a keratin barrel a pinkish structure inside of the cells so you can see it like here keratin barrels anytime you see a keratin barrels done this is a sequimus cell carcinoma so yeah if you see something like that think mucoepidermoid cancer and it's the most common one the last one is the warthin tumor also known as the babillary cytoadenoma uh, uh, lympho, uh, lymphomatosum and it's benign one but um, you need also to be careful about it because um, it has it can also it's benign but it can become malignant as well so it's a cystic tumor with germinal center what does germinal center mean guys which type of tissue will be inside of it if it's germinal center where did we see the word germinal center before absolutely lymphatic tissue lymphatic tissue so it will <clears throat> it will have a lymphatic tissue inside of it and most likely it's because of the smoking okay it can be bilateral or multifocal which means so many regions of the parotid gland will be affected at the same time okay let's speak about achalasia and the achalasia will be the last thing for today i'm sorry people but really i cannot go further the tumors these tumors are not high yield no but for completeness sake we have to speak about them you know so they are not high yield but you are required to know the difference between sialolithiasis and salivary gland tumor which i taught you how to do it okay and you need to know the anatomical position i mean they will not ask you about the mucoepidermoid carcinoma but they might ask you about a tumor that um, something that has invaded a nerve leading you to having a facial bills uh, a facial palsy and they will be like hmm well which nerve is affected and you have to say cranial nerve number seven okay achalasia it's a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax due to degeneration of the inhibitory neurons if the inhibition is absent what what the muscle will have contraction absolutely so there will be a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax due to degeneration of the inhibitory neurons containing nitric oxide and the IV in the myenteric Auerbach plexus of the esophageal wall basically the nitric oxide and the VIB both of them help in the relaxation and they are produced by the myenteric plexus if you remember that was between the circularis uh, in the tunica muscularis of the of the wall and in the tunica muscularis we had two layers anybody remember the two layers of the tunica muscularis longitudinal muscle and the other one the messina was in the submucosa not in the muscularis and the other one was the circularis yeah circularis yes in between them we had the meantheric plexus which was responsible for the inhibition or the stimulation so now we have destruction of the inhibitory neurotransmitter so we'll have hyperexcitation what does the word chalasia mean guys chalasia no chalasia mean relaxation relaxation so when i say achalasia it means absence of the relaxation yes so you need to become achalactic so you need to have no relaxation you will need to always be contracted so primary achalasia is idiopathic secondary achalasia can be due to chagos disease which is caused by a trebonesema cruzii infection can somebody remind me this chagos disease what was the vector for it what what what, what have transmitted it to human beings 
Which one? No, it was not the Exodus, no. Chagos disease came to us from the kissing bug. Yeah, kissing bug. And uh, the next thing is extraesophageal malignancies can comp if this is the esophagus and the someone has extraesophageal malignancy if it's going to compress the esophagus it's going to lead to compression of the esophagus absolutely it leads to the megacolon but why the megacolon because of the achalasia uh, so we we can have in this patient the chagos megacolon megalocardia big heart sorry cardiomegaly and also megaloesophagus remember they can also have unilateral angioedema yes so they can present with a progressive dysphagia to solid and liquid. In obstruction, however, it's a primarily solid, at least initially. Why? Because if somebody has a tumor of his esophagus, the water can still go. So it's, and eventually the water cannot go. So it's a progressive type of dysphagia. In contrast with achalasia, it's just no water, no food. It's associated with increased risk of esophageal cancer. Make a note, both type of esophageal cancer, which means both the sequimus cell carcinoma and also the adenocarcinoma, okay? Manometry finding include uncoordinated or absent peristalsis. That means that you will constantly have a contraction with an increased lower esophageal sphincter resting pressure. They like to show you a picture like this, like, let's imagine that this, this is a graph and they give you this. This is one. This is two. And this is a three. And they tell you that this is at the lower esophageal sphincter and, there is, and, and this represents the length of this, represents how much contraction do we have. Which one of these is a chalasia? No, a chalasia is a constant contraction. So it will be the highest amount of contraction, okay? the highest amount of contraction. There is so much contraction and no relaxation, okay? Also, this is the norm. Why? Because the esophagus normally should have peristalsis. It should not have constant peristalsis. Uh, it should not have something constant like that. It should be peristaltic up and down, up and down, up and down. Why should, be, why should the esophagus have the peristalsis? What do you think? Why should it keep going up and down? To move the food, absolutely. Guys, I have a question. If you bring a person, put him upside down, and you make him a drink water, will it be able to go to his stomach? I mean, if you flip him over. Yep, absolutely. The, they have done it. I, I cannot find it, but uh, basically there was a, a study done by barium. Take a look at the barium goes. See, take a look here. See, 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 see. So they done it like the patient has been put in upside down and uh, they, they give him this barium and they made him swallow it. The peristalsis are so strong in the esophagus that it was able to force the water to go inside of the stomach quite interesting so if we go back here um, there will be no peristalsis as you saw it was just a constant contraction in contrast with peristalsis which can occur in a normal case barium swallow shows dilated esophagus with an area of distal stenosis which is the bear be bird beak sign which is the nose of the bird basically and the treatment can be with surgery endoscopic procedure like botulinism toxin injection why would I inject Botox into it? What Botox do? The botulinism toxin is Botox. What does it do? No, it does not contract. No, 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 no. 
why these ladies inject themselves with a lot of uh, Botox? Because they, absolutely, because they lead to relaxation. They lead to paralysis, yeah? And the problem here is constant contraction. So if we are paralyzing the muscles, they are going to have much more relaxation. And the contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter is going to... decrease absolutely uh, because of the injection of the botox there will be more relaxation which lead to lower esophageal sphincter tone to decrease which lead to the easier passage of the food okay next time i will be going over manometry one more time i'm really sorry for today we only done like three pages i really wanted to do more but i have to rest for today so for tomorrow we continue as usual uh, hopefully by tomorrow evening everything will be fine. Thank you so much and I will see you guys tomorrow.